a common uh, kind of I don't know if it's a mistake or a bit of a discouraging trend we're seeing as we go out there around industry is that so many aiming plants are run basically by computer, just looking at the DCS screen. Yes, from a DCS screen, you can control valve openings, you can control levels, you can control temperature settings. But when the aiming is not behaving the way your computer program expects it to, you need to know what to do about it. And heat stable aiming salts will take everything you think you know about aiming and throw it out the window. So there has to be more than just one or maybe two people in your company that understand the chemistry side of aiming. This is part two of our video series on heat stable aiming salts. This one is for the operators and the engineer of the unit. We need to know exactly the effect heat stable salts have on our aiming, how to know where they're coming from, how to stop them from forming, and what to do about them once they're in your system. Welcome to the Experts Network. Welcome back to the Experts Network. My name is Ben Spooner. I'm a process engineer with Amy and Experts, and today we are going to continue our discussion on heat stable amine salts. If you have not seen part one of this video series, go back and watch it. Otherwise, this one probably won't make sense. But super quick five second review we talked about what heat stable salts are. We mentioned they're different than degradation, and we talked about what causes heat stable salts oxygen, elemental sulfur, production chemicals, cyanides, all kinds of things. Now we're going to talk about how do you know which one of those is getting into your system. Okay. And you need to have an aiming analysis. My colleague Steve did a whole video on this. Boom. There it is right up there. Click that link. He talks about the importance of what we would refer to normally as off-site aiming analysis. This is typically done by your aiming vendor or by us. We can do it too. Where we break down the individual acid anions in your aiming to determine what is making up the bulk of your heat stable aiming salts. The first one we want to discuss today is oxygen. Oxygen or elemental sulfur, they both have similar effects on the amine, They're kind of like similar but different in ways, but let's go through the type of acid anions you can expect to see if you get contamination by oxygen or elemental sulfur in your amine, and the list is long. This is almost how you know when you're getting oxygen attacks. It just forms a whole bunch of stuff. Nobody, nothing else really does this. So we have Formate is the big one. Acetate, oxalate, I gotta look at my list, thiosulfate, glycolate, propionate, um, and any other eight that uh, you might not have even heard of. If you see all of these forming at once, the chances are it is from oxygen or possibly elemental sulfur. Elemental sulfur is a little bit easier to identify because you'll see it in your amine filters. It's a, it's a physical solid, so it plugs stuff off as well as causes these reactions. Um, oxygen normally comes from two sources. Either it's entering with your feed gas and going right into your amine absorber, or if you have a surge tank, uh, it can be coming in from there as well. It's why we keep blanket gas on our surge tanks, usually the nitrogen or fuel gas, some type of inner gas that will uh, prevent air from getting into the surge tank when the aiming level lowers. Of course, surge tank, the whole purpose of it is to absorb surges in aiming circulation rate. So that level does go up and down. The tank's just at atmospheric pressure. So if that level drops and we don't have blanket gas on, you will suck air into your aiming system. Uh, if the oxygen is in your feed gas though, you know it's in the feed gas because either you don't have a surge tank or you do have one and the blanket gas is on, you check the valve and it's open, then it's coming in from the feed gas. And there is a fair amount of technology that you can put 
in front of your, uh, you know, inlet separator knockout drum for oxygen removal. There's these like catalytic reactors. Our friend Ken McIntosh of Trimeric did a really good paper at the Lawrence Reed conference a couple years ago. I was there to hear it. And he spells out all the different technologies that are out there for oxygen removal from gas. We do a lot of work at the gas plants throughout West Texas. Pretty much all of these have oxygen scavenger technology on them. We know it works. They're not especially complicated no reason for you to be putting up with constant heat stable aiming salt buildup if it's due to oxygen in the feed gas there is technology that can help you and what I'll do is I'll post a link to that paper on our YouTube page or our uh, I guess probably our LinkedIn page when this video goes live so that you can read it for yourself uh, now if we have elemental sulfur that's normally coming, it's, a lot of times it's, it's either from the formation, like where, we, where we're drilling in the first place, or it formed on the pipe and we used a, like a kind of a sulfur scavenger to scrape it off the pipe so we don't have a plugged pipeline, but now it's like traveling along the pipe with your gas. Uh, there basically you just, to remove elemental sulfur, you have to use a, a filter. Put in some type of uh, filter technology that removes solids from gas, whether it's, I don't know, some, a centrifuge or a particle filter. Talk to your filtration company and they'll come up with something for you to remove elemental sulfur. Okay, next one we're going to discuss is SO2. SO2 is pretty much only a problem with tail gas treatment units because the SO2 is created in the sulfur plant and if it, it is not converted into H2S like it's supposed to be before it enters the amine absorber, you wind up getting this SO2 attack of the amine. Now SO2 is mainly known for causing formate, thiosulfate, and acetate. Okay, those are the main three things we see formed when SO2 reacts with amine. So what do you do about it? Well, and there's some misunderstanding there. Some people think, well, I'll use my quench tower. I'll add some caustic to my quench tower. I'll run my quench water with a high pH, and that can be my SO2 scavenger. That is super risky. There's a lot to know about how the pH of quench water really protects an aiming plant against SO2. There's also a lot to know about adding caustic to quench water, whether that helps prevent corrosion or actually causes corrosion. So it's almost a topic for a whole different experts network video. If you guys want more on whether you should add caustic to quench water or not, let us know in the comments. But the short answer is really no, don't add caustic to the quench water unless you're, someone's holding a freaking gun to your head, okay? Mainly what you gotta focus on is a TGTU reactor. That reactor's main job is to convert all of the sulfur species in the gas, including SO2, into H2S. There are a variety of reasons why it may not work the way it's supposed to, and that's also a whole other experts network video is why am I getting SO2 through my TGT reactor? If you want to know more on that, let us know. But the bottom line is, guys, SO2 is a combination of sulfur and oxygen. We already talked about how bad oxygen is. We talked about how bad sulfur is. Well, imagine if those two combine. You get one deadly tag team like this. You really want demolition axe and smash entering your aiming system? I didn't think so! Another contaminant which can cause heat stable amine salts are production chemicals or pipeline chemicals. The most common ones we see from this type of contamination are would be chlorides, acetate, or formate. But what you're really looking for is, is in your list of acid anions that you got from the lab, it's if you're seeing a spike in only one anion and all the rest stay low or unchanged, you know. If there's only one thing, then pretty much that had to be that kill. Like you got acetic acid into your amine, that's why the acetate shot up. Or you got formic acid into your amine, that's why the formate shot up. So look to your production chemicals. Maybe you can uh, either reduce the amount of chemical you're using, go to a different type of chemical, uh, or put in a better type of inlet separator or... Uh, uh, um, coalescing filter that will remove these things okay so production chemicals are getting through your inlet knockout drum you need better technology next we have something that's pretty much associated only with refineries is hydrogen cyanide 
hydrogen cyanide. It's a, it's a nasty reactive acid that comes into the amine plant. We see it form thiocyanate. Okay, it's pretty much the only thing that forms thiocyanate, so look for that in your analysis. It also forms formate and acetate. So lots of things form formate and acetate, but only one thing will form formate, acetate, and thiocyanate. So you've got to look for that in your analysis. Uh, it is seen in certain refinery streams, specifically coker gas, and gas from FCC units. Those are the two that tend to be the highest in HCN. HCN detection in gas is a really tricky one. Uh, we can do it definitely, but we have to order a very specific calibration gas that has a bit of lead time before we can get it. And once you get that cal gas, it's got a really short uh, lifespan. It, it expires real quick and is unusable. So you really need to know what you're doing and be prepared to properly analyze for hydrogen cyanide in your gas stream. However, if it's there and you don't want it getting into your aiming plant, as with everything, there is technology out there that can remove it. Basically, the most common one is a water wash. You bubble the gas through a water wash first, and the water wash contains a cyanide scavenger, such as a polysulfide, ammonium polysulfide, the most common one we've seen in the field. To be honest, guys, if you're looking at setting up some kind of cyanide removing water wash, I would recommend you contact MPR Services. They're the company most known for this type of work. They have a way to simulate it, calculate it, build it, whatever. I don't know what they do, but they're the only ones that I would go to and trust with cyanide removal. There are consequences to your sour water stripper if you choose to go this route. So make sure all of that is taken into account if you decide to remove cyanides. Uh, to be honest, a lot of plants don't remove cyanides or they don't remove, they just let the contamination come in. They let the heat stable salts build up. We talked in the, uh, part one of this video series, some of the negative effects of high levels of heat stable salts. So what guys will do is they'll let it build to a certain degree and then they take action. And that action is normally some type of amine reclamation, we call it, reclaim the amine. And there are three main types of reclaiming. There is uh, electrodialysis, which is like an electrically charged membrane system. Electrocep is the most known company for this, followed by uh, Aiming Global Solutions over in the Middle East, we've heard is doing it now. Next, you can get into ion exchange, where they use like ion exchange resin, the, the acids kind of stick to it. And then once the bed fills up with acid, you regenerate it. Uh, MPR services and Ecotech are kind of the two most known companies for this technology. And then finally, we have vacuum distillation, which is um, primarily known for uh, by CCR. They do vacuum distillation. MPR technologies, we've heard, has also developed a, a way to do this. Anyways, they take the amine, they put it under vacuum, which changes the boiling point properties, etc. And you can vaporize the good amine in water, leave the heavier boiling point heat stable salts behind. So lots of options out there for you to choose from for heat stable salt removal or reclamation. A lot of these companies will come to you, okay, if you want, or you can bundle up your amine into a bunch of trucks and you can ship it to them. We have on-site or off-site removal capabilities. Either way, you don't want the heat stable salts to get too high. You do have to do something about that. And at the same time, you don't want them to get too, too low. Uh, some of the limits that you should keep in mind, basically the simplest one guys, is just add your acid anions up. You don't want them to exceed about 13 to 15,000 ppm, that'd be the maximum. 15,000 ppm acid anions is roughly the equivalent of three weight percent heat stable amine salt, and that's where you're crossing the line. That's where you're gonna have corrosion. In MDEA plants, MDEA is a lot more sensitive to heat stable salts than, than other uh, primary and secondary amines. There we need to lower our limits a little bit to about two and a half percent total heat stable amine salts, or around 13,000 ppm anions. And so what you do there is you get one of these amine analysis done again by your vendor or by us or whoever can break out heat stable salts in their ion chromatograph you just add up all of the anions and you don't want that number to be above those specified limits
that's quite a bit of information on heat stable amine salts for you guys. I hope you learned something. I hope you can now look at your amine plant with a little bit more than just a video game on your computer screen. There is a lot of very interesting chemistry involved as well. Please follow our channel on YouTube and ding the bell so that way you're alerted every time we release a new video and we will see you right back here on the next edition of Experts Network.